the Holy Spirit is here. I'm excited for what he's going to do today. Thank you, God. Thank you. Y'all, you can sit down. <laughs> I want to talk about camp meeting because that's got me quite emotional. I'm up here crying. Camp meeting changed my life. Um, I know it changed the kids' lives who went too. But every major thing that happened in my life that pivoted me to my next position happened at camp meeting. So send your kids to camp. <laughs> Do it. Send them to camp. I also met Jeremy at camp. I did. I sure did. Now listen, my kids don't go to camp and find you. You're too little. That's actually, literally, that's actually a part of this because what the Lord has spoke to me to talk about today was your position, where we position ourselves, where we place ourselves. And I may have met him when I was just 13. And my position where I was, was too early for me. I, my personality is, you know, I move on real quick. I get bored real easy. And the Lord knew that, but he let me meet him and he let me see him. His story was a little different. His position which y'all already know how he feels about me. He gets up here and says it all the time. But he pursued me from that moment. From a 13-year-old boy, he pursued me because that was his position that he was in. And so it was really cool because, you know, your perception is based on your position. Well, my. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> well, my. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. But um, if anybody knows anything about Michigan, I'm from Michigan. And, you know, if you're like, if you live in the Austin area, here we call it the Austin area. There we call it Metro Detroit. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? No, I know there's a couple. Okay, we got a few that are from Michigan. So if you live like within an hour radius, everybody says, I'm from Detroit. I'm from Detroit. You're not really from Detroit. You're from Metro Detroit. Uh, but I will tell you that Detroit has this uh, saying, and it became so popular that other states picked it up. And it was called, I hate saying this, it's a negative saying, I don't like it, but it says Detroit versus everybody. Has anybody ever heard that? Y'all heard it before? Detroit versus everybody. And let me tell you, if you've been there, not everybody's like this. Listen, there's, there's good people from Michigan. I love Michigan. But there is a certain angst. People walk around kind of with a chip on their shoulder. Kind of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you before you get me. I'm going to build up this wall so you can't hurt me because my assumption is you're going to hurt me. And I don't want to be hurt, so here's my wall. So they kind of, the whole culture kind of positioned themselves into a place where it was kind of hard to receive. How do, you, how do you receive something if there's a wall right here? You're going to toss it up over the wall. I, I got it. No, you got to break that wall down, right? Because you have to be able to receive. Well, this was my mindset. You know, it's funny. I didn't even know it. I didn't know it until I came here. I thought, you know, I was a sweet and kind person. Hopefully I am. <laughs> I don't know. But I thought, like, you know, I'm a good person until I got in a different atmosphere, into a different culture. And, you know, when we first moved here, I thought, I waited for the other shoe to drop. You know, I thought, people aren't really this nice. <laughs> Somebody's got ulterior motives, you know. I'm just waiting. You're being so nice to me until... It was, it never happened. It never happened. Southern hospitality is a thing. And thank you all for loving us and accepting us into Texas <laughs> because I love it here. But my wall began to break down and God began to teach me things and to show me things. I began to read his word differently even. And so there's, there's a man in the Bible <laughs> when I read it, Jeremy and I were talking about it, and I said, you know, he was a little Detroit, I think. I think he had a little Detroit. His name is Zacchaeus, 
And he was a rich man, and he was a tax collector, and he was Jewish. And guess what? They didn't like that. He was automatically named a sinner, right? Is being a tax collector a sinner? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But the reason they did that is because tax collectors would skim off the top and they would steal from people. And, you know, here we're, we're Jewish. We're supposed to be in, a, in an economy of God and a culture of this. We're not going to give to the Roman government. It's not what we're going to do. But this is who Zacchaeus is. He was a good man, but he was a tax collector. We meet him in Jericho. It's very important that we meet him in Jericho. And we meet him just days leading up to Holy Week. Oh, God. Y'all, I'm excited to get there. I'm excited to get there. It's very significant that it was Jericho. Jericho means victory. And Zacchaeus was an outsider. And he just wanted to see Jesus. And he receives his victory in Jericho. Let's go to Luke 19 and 1. He entered Jericho. He is Jesus. This is Jesus coming through. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now listen, there, uh, we can go into this. We're not gonna, there was a song about him. All anybody ever talks about was his height. <laughs> It's all anybody ever talks about. Why in the world? But let me show you something really cool. He had heard about Jesus, right? Everybody had heard about Jesus. This was his time, right? Let's just say Jesus is a carpenter for 30 years doing the mundane. But this, this is where it all began to shift. It's where it all began to start. And everybody knew who Jesus was. And Zacchaeus wanted to see him. So like many other people, they would crowd around Jesus as he was talking. They just had to be close to him. I got to hear him. I got to know what he has to say. And they would crowd around him. And Zacchaeus was there. But he couldn't see the face of God. He couldn't see Jesus. He couldn't get to him. He couldn't get close enough. Maybe, maybe it was because of his stature. Maybe it's because people just didn't like him. Why would they? Oh, go ahead. We're not going to let him close to him. They pushed him on the outside. Sometimes that can be us. I just want to see you. Jesus, I just want to get close enough to you. But there's something in the way. People maybe, what people think of you, what people have said about you, because we believe that lie, don't we? We believe what they say. So, verse 4, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Let me tell you that Zacchaeus was desperate. There's another person who was desperate to get to Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood couldn't get through. I can just imagine her pain and her anguish of if I can just touch him, just the hem of his garment, I just want to touch him. I would be healed. There was desperation. Desperation moves the heart of God. Sometimes we just have to get a little bit desperate. Thank you, Jesus. So he also made a plan. He was desperate, but he made a plan. So he's on the outside and he can't get to him this way. So his first position was a position from the outside. I can't get to him. I can't see him. He's too far away. So I need to change my position. So he ran on ahead and he sat in a sycamore tree. Do you know what a sycamore tree means? A sycamore tree biblically means humility and repentance. Sometimes if we can't get 
to Jesus, we have to sit in a place of repentance. I'm going to climb up God and I'm going to say, I might be a good person, but I need to sit here in repentance because that's the only position that you can truly see the face of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Now listen, remember I said we were in Jericho. Jericho is known as the city of palms. Now, obviously it's not easy to climb a palm tree, but he didn't climb in a palm tree. He didn't climb into a place that was, uh, you know, high enough that he could see. He climbed into a sycamore tree so he could sit in repentance. All right. So verse five is my favorite part. When Jesus came to the place. All right. Hold on a minute. We position ourselves over here and you might have to wait. You might have to just sit there and say, are you coming? I know you're coming. I can see you coming. But God, I'm just going to wait here because I know you're going to pass me by. I know you're coming my way. And when you do, I know something's going to happen. And this is where his faith began to build. His faith rose up. Thank you, Jesus. This may have been the first time (laughs) that he was thankful for his height. Because had he not been able, if he could see Jesus, if he was up close, he wouldn't have gotten to that tree. It's not where he would have been. So don't let what you think is holding you back. Let me, let me tell you about that right now. My whole life, I let every word stick to me, good and bad. If somebody said, Nina, you can sing, you need to sing. Oh, okay, I'm going to sing. If somebody said, Nina, you're stupid just because you have blonde hair. I thought I was stupid. And the Lord said, take it all away. Don't listen to any of it. Not the good and not the bad. You listen to me. You listen to my voice and what I say about you. So every time a word comes, I weigh it against the word of God. Is that what you say? Does that line up with the word of God? And if it doesn't, let me tell you right now, throw it out throw it out you listen to what he says and only what he says so Jesus is coming by he knows he's coming he's watching him he's like okay here we go here we go and uh when Jesus came to the place he looked up (laughs) I love this don't miss it he looked up and he said to him Zacchaeus Zacchaeus How many people do you know that have 10 verses in a Bible and they say their name? Not so many. Let me tell you that he knows where you are and he knows your name. He is going to call you by name. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house. So here, (laughs) don't you love it? It's that, ugh. I love it because everybody, everybody is pushing him out, pushing him out. Can you imagine what that felt like for him to call you by name? Can you imagine you're sitting in a tree? He says your name. Hey, hey, I'm going to go to your house today. Hurry up. Let me get out of this tree. (laughs) I would be running, running to get out of that tree. So he hurried and came down and he received him joyfully. He was joyful. He was happy. And when they, they, when they saw it, they all grumbled. (laughs) He has gone to be a guest in the house of a man who's a sinner. I'm going to ask you a question. Can your joy carry you through verse 7? When you have joy coming out of the tree... Can you survive what everybody's going to say about you? Can your joy survive verse 7? Because sometimes we have to tune that out. I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to listen to that. He's calling my name. This, This right here is where I got confused. This is where I got confused. For 32 years. Listen, I have loved God my whole life, my whole life, 
But when I was eight years old, oh, oh my, I remember this day. I will never forget this day. I was eight years old. We had an evangelist come to the church. This is old school church, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Sunday morning, he preached a message and boy, a fire was birthed in me. And he was talking about how you can have the Holy Spirit and how he wants to fill you. And I was like, I I want that. I want that. No, I I really want that. I want that. And I got so excited. And I went home that day and I had desperation. I had desperation like Zacchaeus. And I made a plan and I said, I'm getting that tonight. I had determination. I'm going tonight and I want that. That sounds pretty awesome. That's something that I want. So here I am. Go with me just for a minute. Here I am. That preacher talked so long. (laughs) All I wanted to do was run to that altar and I'm like, stop talking and let me get to Jesus. And as soon as he gave the altar call, I remember where I was sitting, right about where you are, Miss Karen. And I ran and I remember right where I was in the altar. And let me tell you that this is love, but this is what happened. This is how the enemy can change something and set you on a different path. In that moment, I was instantly surrounded by so many people. And it was love. It was love. People wanted to help me. They wanted to pray with me. They wanted to do this and that. But let me tell you, I had somebody's hot breath in this year. <laughs> I had somebody saying, hold on, and somebody saying, let go. I had somebody touching my chin. <laughs> Y'all, literally, I was so sensory overloaded. <laughs> And I was like, what is happening? This is not supposed to feel like this. <laughs> and I was standing. This is what's significant. I was standing like this. They call this receiving hands. My hands were like this. And a sweet, sweet lady who loves me dearly, and I love her dearly. And she meant no harm. She didn't say anything wrong. She was right. But Satan took that and twisted it. This is what happened. She physically took my hands. And she turned them this way. And she said, (laughs) you have to surrender for him to fill you with his spirit. You have to stand like this. Turn your hands like this to surrender. Let me tell you that that's the truth. But surrendering is a heart posture. It's a heart posture. In my whole life, I had been that way. Because she didn't know how I was raised. She didn't know that I was afraid to look sideways. (laughs) That I was afraid to breathe. That I was like, I have fantastic parents. But I was a well-behaved child. You better believe that. And when that happened, when my hand turned, what I heard was, you're not doing enough to receive it. Let me tell you what. The Holy Spirit is a gift. And how do you receive it if you're doing this? How do you receive it? Your hands have to be like this. So the Holy Spirit took me back to that moment and he showed me myself as an eight-year-old little girl. It was really special. And he said, Nina, you have always worshiped me. You have always surrendered to me. You have always praised me, but you have never learned how to receive from me as your father. So I turned my hands like this in that moment, and I said, okay, okay, let's do it. Whatever you have for me, I want it. I want it. I don't got to earn it. I want it. Whatever you have for me, I'm going to take it. Oh, I think that Zacchaeus was a little bit like this. I think that he was jaded because he was pushed to the outside for so long, And he was told, because of what you do, not who you are, but because of what you do, you're unworthy. And that's a lie. And that lie can keep you bound. For me, it was 32 years. This is the thing. Y'all, here we go. We were were warming up, but this is the thing. Jesus teaches us. Something about forgiveness and how we receive it that we think we have to earn it, but we don't. We just have to change our position. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So in order, what does the word say? Then in order to receive forgiveness, we have to forgive. Forgiveness is a tricky thing. We all want it, but we don't all want to give it. And you know, sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to forgive somebody who never apologizes. Because forgiveness isn't about them. It's about you and your heart posture. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, remember, we're going in to Holy Week. So just days later, several days, but still days later, Jesus was going to be going to Calvary. He knew his plan. His ministry was, well, his ministry was his whole life, but his active ministry was only three years. So he doesn't have a lot of time. So for him to take the time, to take the time to say, Ezekiel, come down. I want to go spend some time with you, says so much. And he feels that way about you, too. He wants to spend time with you. And he wants us to live how he lives. (laughs) So... We know Holy Week, the Lord's Supper takes place during Holy Week. This is where Jesus teaches us about forgiveness. And uh, y'all, this isn't my brain. I don't have this brain. I'm not the smart, you know, whatever. But this is what I learned this week, and it blew my mind. And I cannot not share it with you, and you're going to be glad that I did. Jesus connects bread to forgiveness. Let's talk about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. What's the very next verse? Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Goes both ways. You can't do one and not the other. You can't do one and not the other. At the Last Supper, he gave them bread. He said, this is my body. My body that is broken for you. (laughs) And guess what? Jesus is the bread of life. So here we go. This is what's too smart for me, but all y'all are going to get it. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In Hebrew, they say it, Bet Lechem, which means house of bread. House of bread. Do you know that Hebrew is alphanumerical? So there's a number that goes with each word with each phrase so the word the number for it is 490 moladari pretty sure i didn't say that right but the lord knows is nativity nativity the alphanumeric number is 490 tamim is to be made perfect or complete The number is 490. So Jesus, perfect, 490, born in Bethlehem, 490, was the perfect sacrifice, 490. Peter asks Matthew, (laughs) chapter 18, how many times? How many times do I have to forgive? Seven? What did he say? What is 70 times seven? 490. It's 490. We can't get there. We can't become complete until we learn how to forgive like Jesus, how to sit in repentance and learn how to forgive so we can move forward. Because let me tell you, he's got a plan for you. Our first position might be, I can't even see you, Jesus. Our second position is, okay, I'm going to sit in repentance. Our third position is, come on and come to my house. Come to my house. We're going to spend some time together. We're moving past all of this. Thank you, Jesus. 
Oh, Father, you are worthy. I can imagine that Zacchaeus had to forgive a whole lot of people. He didn't do anything wrong. Do you know his actual name means righteous? His name means righteous. So, and Zacchaeus stood, this is verse eight, sorry. Zacchaeus stood and said, all right, listen close. I want you to hear this. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. All these people are grumbling about him. He didn't talk to those people. It doesn't say he said to them. He said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Was he defending himself to the people? It wasn't. He said, I am a righteous man and I deserve this. And you might think that, but you're wrong <laughs> because he says right here. And Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Did he deserve it? He deserved it. He is a son of Abraham. You are a son of Abraham. We have access. Don't let anybody tell you who you are except him. Today, today salvation has come to the house. Today, that's what Jesus said to him. Today, your whole life is different. I've watched you. I've watched you be far. I've watched you sit in a place. I've watched each position. I've watched you be desperate. And today, not tomorrow, not another day. I want to get to know you. You know, you meet someone and you exchange numbers. No, no, no. He didn't even do that. Today, get down. We're going. Right now, we're going. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! All right, so. Uh, I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and I'm trying to behave. <laughs> I'm trying to be good. <laughs> I got permission. He said, I don't have to be good. Uh, y'all know I'm a singer. I think y'all know. If you don't, I'm a singer. My whole life I'd been a singer. Right here in this front row, we had a pastoral prayer meeting. And I don't mean to tell stories about myself, but it's relevant and I have to do it because he's telling me to do it. Right here on this front row, he told me to move. I was over here. And he told me to move over to, to stand in front of the seat. And I was unsure why, but I did it. Because listen, I will tell you this. I might mess up. I might not be the most intelligent, but he has my yes. Whatever he tells me to do, I will do it. He told us, sell your dream house. He said, give up your church and move to Texas. Okay, God, to do what? To sit. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it because you have a plan. He has a plan. Please give him your yes. I don't care what it looks like. Give him your yes. So at this prayer meeting, there was just a few of us, maybe eight of us. And I was standing here. He told me to go stand over there. And he said, Nina, ask me why you sing. And I thought that was real weird. <laughs> so I kind of didn't answer him. Maybe my yes is not always immediate. And he asked me again, Nina, <laughs> Why do you sing? And I said, okay, okay, why do I sing? And he said, your mother prayed a double portion over you. Now, y'all don't know my mother, but I'm talking about the most anointed woman of God I've ever heard sing in my life. She would open her mouth to sing and people would be healed where they sat. She carried such an anointing. And that's all she wanted was for me to sing. And so he said, your mother prayed a double portion on you. So I honored your mother and I blessed you, but I never called you to sing. And then I knew why he asked me to sit in front of a chair because I literally, under the weight of that, I had to sit down. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I am sorry for not doing what you told me to do. And he said, what did I call you to do? And I said, you called me to preach. And I couldn't even say it. 
Because, you know, I didn't want to be the person. I was raised humble. You have to, you can't be the one who's me, me, me. So I was raised in the back, you know, to be quiet. And I couldn't even say it out loud. You call, you call me to preach? You call me to preach? He said, no, with authority. What did I call you to do? I said, okay, you called me to preach. He said, okay, so sit down from worship. Give me your yes. And it's going to be hard because this is what's easy. This is what you've always done. But I'm going to ask you to lay that down and pursue me in a different way. So I can take you into a different position and elevate you to what I want you to do. And he wants to do that with you today. It doesn't stop there. Because let me tell you what, when Jesus told Zacchaeus that you are also a son of Abraham, you know what the blessing of Abraham is? It's provision and it's security and it's authority. Can we stand today? Because right now in this house, if we can receive it, this is what we have for us. I'm going to step out. I might be afraid. I saw a story today that said, or yesterday, that said, stop doing it afraid. You know, we always say that. I don't want to do it, but I'm afraid. Stop doing it afraid and do it anointed. Do it anointed. Each and every one of you are called and anointed for kingdom work. And he wants you to move on out of that today. So right now, if you feel that prick in your heart that God is wanting to do something, don't sit down and say, it's not for me. It is for you. It's for you and you and you and your children and your children's children. So today when he's calling you, you need to give him your yes. Can we give him our yes today?